It's the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Stand up, stand up. You've been sitting way too long. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. My name is Steve Scrovan, along with my co-host, David Feldman. Hello, David. Hello, everybody. Good to have you here. And it's also good to have the man of the hour here, Ralph Nader. Hello, Ralph. What a program. Wait until you hear it, listeners. Exactly. And I want to start off, though, I want to mention another progressive voice we've lost recently. His name is Lawrence Ferlinghetti. He's a poet, an artist, and he founded City Lights Books. And Mr. Ferlinghetti passed away on February 22nd. I believe he is 101 years old. And he opened City Lights in 1953 in San Francisco as an all paperback bookstore and started publishing two years later with the objective of stirring an, quote, international dissident ferment, unquote. And he certainly did that. He was arrested and prosecuted for publishing Allen Ginsberg's seminal poem, Howl, in 1956. And his acquittal was a landmark victory for First Amendment protection in the arts. So, Ralph, you wanted to comment on that. There was so much to his life. He's a great humanitarian, a cultural innovator, and just a wonderful all-around person. And there should be a biography of him. There have been some widespread obituaries in the major newspapers. So if you want to learn more about his long and wise and creative life, go to their websites, the New York Times and other publications. All right. Very good. Rest in peace, Lawrence Ferlinghetti. Now we're going to get to the show. And I want to say that voting for president is a bit like making a New Year's resolution. You buy the exercise bike, swear this year will be different. This year, you'll prioritize your mental and physical health. This year, you'll do a little every day, even if it's not fun. Pretty soon, a few weeks later, the bike is a coat rack. Every four years, Americans vote for president. We slap on our I voted sticker. We tweet about it. And then, coat rack. Our excitement and motivation may not take us much farther than that one gesture. Our daily lives take over and we neglect our civic health. The processes that control our lives are massive and intimidating and complicated. That's true. But if we take a closer look at our immediate surroundings, city and community councils or school boards or state governments, it's easier to find a way in. It would be wonderful if we could all work together as a nation and make Joe Biden suddenly a progressive and flip a dozen Republican senators so the Congress can move forward with helping actual people. Keep that on the list. But what about writing a letter to your state senator, organizing a voter registration drive, delivering groceries to elderly neighbors? While we chip away at changing the big system, we can act every day to change our own microsystems. And when it comes to the microsystem of this program, one thing you can all do is send us your listener questions. We answer as many as we can, and our guests today are here because of your questions. Our first guest will be union activist Kay Tillo. We'll be digging into union health coverage and Medicare Advantage. This is in response to listener Carolyn Odessa's question. To hear Carolyn's original question, check out our Killer Airbags episode from a few weeks ago. It's still archived there at ralphnaderradiohour.com. Our second guest will be another star of the Killer Airbags episode, Evan Weissman. That's when he wrote to us. And we'll be drilling down into civic health itself and how we can claim our own power as stakeholders to make our communities better. And as usual, we'll also check in with our corporate crime reporter, Russell Mo Kyber. But first, let's talk about Medicare disadvantage. David? Kay Tillo is a union activist and executive director of the Nurses Professional Organization. She also organizes unions for single-payer health care to push and empower labor unions to make single-payer a priority. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Kay Tillo. Thanks. Happy to be here. Welcome indeed, Kay. We're going to talk again about what we talked about earlier on this show. Medicare disadvantage. I don't even like to use the word Medicare advantage. This is one of the cruelest corporate scams that I've come across in many years, in part because of the gigantic nature of it, in part because it's looting Medicare and corporatizing Medicare with companies like Aetna United Healthcare, and in part because all the groups that we would rely on to stop this Stop the deception, the deceiving of elderly people, sucking them into Medicare disadvantage, have looked the other way. So why don't you tell our listeners, some of whom may be about to enroll in Medicare, why 
it's such a bad deal? Well, the Medicare advantage or disadvantage, basically it's the for-profit part of our Medicare, the piece of Medicare that has been turned over to the private insurance companies. And it's a very bad deal, both for the seniors who go into it and for we, the public, who have to finance Medicare because they're taking our Medicare funds and turning them over in, by the billions to the health insurance companies. The reason why it works for them is that they've been able to get to Congress to cooperate in setting it up so that it can be in the beginning for a senior who enrolls. That person can save money. They even now have a piece of it that says get the give back benefit, which means that for some people you can save $148 a month back into your Social Security check which, you know, is just huge amount for people who are living on very limited income. So it seems to be something that is to the advantage of the average person. And they may indeed, if they don't get sick, <laughs> which is a big gamble for elderly people, but if they don't get sick, they may save money for a period of time. And that's why it's just so frustrating that this terrible plan draws people in because they've designed it and Congress has allowed them to design it in a way that sucks people into what in the end will be a very bad plan for the patient. And they even have lunches where they lure seniors. In that way, they lure the seniors who are mobile and who are more healthy, and that's what they want to do. So as people who have criticized Medicare disadvantage say, Medicare disadvantage when you get sick suddenly something happens when you really get sick do you have your free choice of doctor or hospital do they actually pay the claims or they treat you the way they treat other policyholders in the private market system and drive them crazy in terms of not paying benefits what's the scene i mean the whole idea of getting medicare is if you get sick if you get sick but if you get sick on medicare disadvantage then you will find that your choices are limited because there's a list of doctors you can use and there's a whole bigger list that you can't use. And you can't get into the rehab centers or, you know, the facilities that you need because that's also limited. The insurance company is limiting your ability to a network that is very narrow and you will have additional expenses. So the drugs may cost you a fortune once you need expensive drugs. So in the end, you will end up with paying more once you get sick. And that's, of course, how the program is designed. When you're healthy and they can make money off of you, they get money from Medicare, then they like you. Once you get sick, then it's not to your advantage to be there. And people try to go back to the traditional Medicare, which is what they want you to do because they make more money if the sick people go back onto the public plan. They get rid of them onto the That's traditional right. Medicare. And then another ugly surprise confronts the person who quits Medicare disadvantage and goes back to traditional Medicare. And what's that? That surprise is the supplementary plan, the Medigap plan that you could purchase when you first became eligible for Medicare with no discrimination if you had pre-existing conditions. Now is not available to you because the insurance company, the Medigap insurers can deny you to sell you a policy or can charge you a fortune to get back on. So you're having ventured into Medicare disadvantage, you now can't even get back to the traditional Medicare because you can't buy a Medigap plan 
that would cover you. And that's what that no one's saying that. Joe Namath doesn't say that in the ads. Joe Namath? And What's Joe Namath got to do with this? <laughs> well, he's the one that they are using as the spokesperson to try to sell these plans so you can't turn on your TV without hearing an ad to sign up in these Medicare Advantage plans. And whoever's writing the script works to make it sound like there's many, many additional benefits that you will get and all you have to do is enroll. It's very deceptive and it should not be allowed. Congress should shut this off and say no more. Yeah, we're going to get to this in a moment in terms of all the watchdogs, so-called, that have sold the seniors down the river. People should know 40% of all seniors are now stuck in Medicare disadvantage desperately hoping, if they know anything about how they have been misled, that they don't get sick. 40%. They had a huge push in the last year, scaring all kinds of seniors, mailings, Joe Namath TV ads. Joe Namath should be ashamed of himself. He's supposed to be avoiding sacks, and instead he's sacking millions of seniors. So 40%. Where's it all going? I mean, this is the corporatization of Medicare. While people are talking about single payer, full Medicare for all, where are the watchdogs on saving Medicare from just being turned into a bonanza for Aetna, United Healthcare, and the other big insurance companies that are profiteering off this and really harming seniors? The cases I've heard are heartrending. Do you want to give one of the, one or two of the cases of what really happens? Well, there's a case of a San Diego man who was in Medicare Advantage and saving money, and then he had a mild heart attack, and soon he was back on his feet, but then he found that he had to pay hundreds and hundreds of dollars every month for his drugs, and he couldn't afford it, so then he wanted to re-sign up, and his insurance broker told him, they won't sell you a Medigap plan because you now have a pre-existing condition. And the protection that you had in the beginning no longer is there. In the meantime, he was paying hundreds of dollars in monthly copays, right? Copays for drugs and other health services, including $295 a night for a hospital stay on Medicare disadvantage. Is that right? <laughs> That's right. That's right. In other words, what once saved you money now costs you money and becomes way beyond your means and then you can't get back. And so our Medicare is becoming worse and worse and worse. And Congress, you know, has allowed it to go in this direction and to allow these companies, you know, we pay an average of $1,000 more per person on Medicare Advantage than we pay for people on traditional Medicare. That money goes to those private insurance companies, and it means we're paying more for the people who are the healthiest. Which means that the majority of seniors who are still in traditional Medicare are subsidizing Aetna and United Healthcare for the Medicare disadvantage plans. Is that correct? That's right. That's the way it looks to me. Well, it even gets worse, listeners. The insurance companies, having misled, millions of seniors who have fallen into the Medicare disadvantage plans, they then turn the seniors into lobbyists on Congress. They say, tell your senator representative to save Medicare. And so all these members of Congress are getting these messages, save Medicare. And it's not clear that what they're really saying is save the profits of the insurance companies in the Medicare disadvantage plans. That's and that's right. why you have all kinds of Democrats every year supporting Medicare disadvantage along with the Republicans. I think they got 300 votes in the House in 2019 and a ton of senators. Right. I think there were 66 senators and over 300 in the House who signed on to the insurance company letter, AHIP, the American Association of Insurers. And they are the ones who are organizing these Medicare Advantage seniors to say, oh, you're in danger. They want to take 
your Medicare away from you and, you know, call your congressperson, get him to sign on, get her to sign on to our letter. So there's so much confusion out there that they're able actually to use the people they're abusing to <laughs> lobby the Congress in favor of the profiteers. It's outrageous. Okay, now, the only way this diabolical scheme can work and continue to erode and destroy traditional Medicare is for the following groups to continue to do nothing, or worse, to support it. Okay, let's start. AARP, what is their position on Medicare disadvantage? They're supposed to represent millions of seniors, have chapters all over the country. They talk a big deal about consumer protection. Where are they? I don't think they're helping us at all. They're connected with the United Healthcare, the insurance company. I don't know what their position is on this, but I don't they're, see anything that they're doing for us. Well, I just got the AARP Bulletin magazine. There's a full page ad, United Healthcare, deceiving the readers and to lure them into Medicare disadvantage. So I think AARP is at least complicit. And they begin to say, well, it's a choice. You can have a choice, traditional Medicare, Medicare Advantage, as they call it. We can't let them off the hook there. They got specialists. They got economists. They got consumer protectors. Strike one against AARP. What about the labor unions? AFL-CIO perched in that wonderful building on 16th Street in Washington, D.C. They have good insurance plans for their members, but they have a big website. They have locals all over the country. They have retirees all over the country, like SEIU, bought into the Medicare disadvantage, as we pointed out earlier in a program. And they have 52,000 retirees who go automatically into Medicare disadvantage. They're not even given a choice, and they don't even know what's happened until they get sick. So what about the AFL-CIO and the big unions? You're a, a union organizer extraordinaire with the nurses and other workers. What do you say there? Well, the AFL-CIO should break from any support for Medicare Advantage because it's harmful to seniors and it's harmful to Medicare. I take it the nurses are an exception. They're trying to blow the whistle on this. I don't know that there's been any particular statements gone okay. out about it, but we here in Kentucky, we have appealed to the Kentucky AFL-CIO and the Kentucky Alliance for Retired Americans, and they're very supportive of us. All right. Strike two on organized labor unions led by the AFL-CIO. All right. What about Congress here? Are there any champions for seniors going after Medicare disadvantage, demanding the Federal Trade Commission crackdown demanding public hearings, not the Democrats control the House and Senate? I haven't seen anything on that. I've seen them all sign on to that letter in support, and it's just amazing. I think there may have been some moves in the past that sought to reduce the amount, you know. I think that CMS reports that these Medicare Advantage companies are being paid $200 billion over the next 10 years in excess, even what they say is excess. So I think there have been some moves to try to do it, but they never get anywhere. And That's no one that I know of is speaking eloquently about this in the Congress. They need to. Well, there are people who voted against it, and they're mostly people who signed on to Representative Jayapal's single-payer bill, which was, I think, 676 last year, has been renamed to H.R. 1384. That's the gold standard for single-payer, according to singlepayeraction.org, which people should go to for updates. So generally, collectively, although there's some good people voting against it, they don't seem to be making much noise about it back home in congressional districts, it's strike three on the Congress. Okay. What about the Federal Trade Commission? They're supposed to be pouncing on deceptive ads, and you couldn't get a more deceptive ad having currency all over the country without any law enforcement action. What about the Federal Trade Commission? Well, I haven't seen anything that they've done on this. The ads continued night and day, and they don't seem to be doing anything about it. 
And the ads were really a barrage in the last few months. I mean, it helped shore up the post office. People were getting all these appeals, fancy appeals, go to Medicare disadvantage, as they call it. Mm -hmm. Most of the profits now of these insurance companies come from public money, these public funds that are run through their hands, and therefore we lose a big amount of the money that we could use for health care. Right. And you were saying, what's that $200 billion figure over 10 years? It's $200 billion that CMS, you know, that's the government body that oversees Medicare and Medicaid, says that they're being overpaid by $200 billion over 10 years, the Medicare Advantage companies. So even they know <laughs> that this is occurring, that it's a ripoff. But they don't move to do anything about it. And I guess every time someone opens their mouth, you know, AHIP does another letter and gets all of the Congress to sign on to. It it is amazing. They need some backbone. It is amazing because, you know, 40 percent of all Medicare seniors are in these plans. They don't have free choice of doctor and hospital. They're steered into these lists. And some of them are not good practitioners to begin with. They're not refereed adequately. And, of course, you have to hassle with the insurance company when you really get sick. It's a nightmare. You cannot believe how it has disrupted millions of families and individuals. Billings and piecemeal reaction can't get through to your health insurer and on and on. Now, let's go to a part of your statement, Kay, that caught my attention. And I'm going to quote it. The ad for Medicare Advantage or Disadvantage, you say, states that Medicare coverage helpline and all service marks or trademarks owned by Together Health PAP LLC. In June of 2019, this company, Together Health, was acquired by Health Insurance Innovations a company that is facing at least two class action lawsuits over its alleged role in a health insurance scam that built millions of dollars from consumers and that the Federal Trade Commission shut down last fall, a report in Truth in Advertising. Shut down last fall. So it becomes more criminally intriguing here, and we can assign some responsibility for these devious, intricate, fine print schemes to the corporate attorneys who work in these white shoe law firms that reporters still refer to as prestigious law firms. They're basically brokers for corporate criminal and civil violations and deceptions. So where are we now? What's the next step? What do you tell our listeners to do practically? Well, I would say inform people as much as you can about it. Ask your congressperson to oppose this. Get these private insurers out of our Medicare system. But I really believe that the best way to fix it is to do a national improved Medicare for all and fix the whole thing at once so that we fix health care by taking out of it the private insurers that are making it cost a fortune and are stealing our funds and depriving people of the care they deserve. And here's the scene on Capitol Hill regarding single payer. Congresswoman Jay Appel, the champion of single payer, announced in January that she was going to reintroduce the single payer bill that she introduced two years ago. Here we are in the beginning of March, and still no bill. Why is there no bill, Congresswoman Jay Appel? She has a very good answer, which she hasn't made public. What is it? The answer is Nancy Pelosi. Nancy Pelosi in the leadership in the House telling the rank-and-file Democrats, focus on expanding Obamacare with all its refusal to control costs and its intricate, mind-numbing complexity, and do not focus on single payer. So Congresswoman Jay Appel is sincerely circulating this bill to the Democrats, hoping that she'll get over 135 co-signers, which she got last year. Well, February, she's not getting it. She's getting a few dozen. She's not getting 
up to 135, which is why she's postponing the publicity and the announcement on this legislation. Because if she gets 80 or 90 or 100 instead of 135, when you have a Democrat in the White House, less than what they had two years ago when you had Trump in the White House, it feels like a defeat, like the momentum is slipping, like the Democrats are abandoning single payer. So it's not her fault. She's trying to urge her fellow Democrats to stand up the way they did two years ago, at least, and sign on to H.R. 1384. And the House leadership in the Democrat Party is undermining it. Now, that story is not broken yet, but it just shows you the endless cowardliness, the endless corporatism that these Democrats are infected with. And that's the dilemma now she has. So the contrast you just pointed out, that the solution to this whole Medicare nightmare called Medicare disadvantage, and also the incomplete nature of the traditional Medicare, is single payer. Public insurance, everybody in, nobody out, free choice of doctor and hospital, coming in at dramatically lower costs, saving over 100,000 American lives a year, which studies have shown are lost because people cannot afford health insurance in order to get diagnosed and treated in time. What is it going to take, Kay, to raise the indignation level of millions of Americans to say to Congress, time's up, straighten out, join the community of nations that have universal health care, or else you're going to be unemployed? I think people are trying to say that. I think that we now have majority uh, that is for it. The people of our country are not mean and ugly. They want everybody to have health care, the vast majority. And we saw it even in Fox did a poll. It said 72 percent were for the government responsibility to make sure that everyone had health care. So I think the people are there, but Congress isn't listening to us. And that's That's the problem. Congress, the Democrats and the Republicans have their ears closed when it comes to the real solution, and we have to push more. They have their ears closed and their pocketbooks open, huh? (laughs) It could be. (laughs) Well, your figures are very compelling. In fact, the large majority of Democratic voters are for single payer. Almost 50-50 now among Republican voters. You know, they want the same thing. They want health care. They don't want to have their families denied a moment of health crisis, illness, sickness, trauma. A majority of nurses want it. A majority of physicians want it. What's wrong with a majority of Congress? The answer, my dear listeners, is one we have talked about again and again. Start a letterhead organization in your district. Nobody can stop you from doing that. Call yourself a Congress watchdog group. Have the letterhead said single payer now. Save lives, save money, save aggravation, universal health care. And then start getting people in your district, your neighborhood to sign on and demand, summon your senators and representatives to town meetings. First, now under COVID, it's virtual. And when COVID is over, it's actual. But it's virtual. It's easier. It's harder for them to say no to you. Where you face them, you face your senators, two senators and representatives, and you read them what needs to be told. And you say, we want your answer in writing. We want it on your website, Senator, Representative. I can't imagine, Kay, that this is a big hurdle for at least 1% of the people, two and a half million people in 435 Democratic small d districts, House districts. What do you think's wrong with the American people? It's one thing answering a poll, but it's in their own self-interest, their desperate self-interest to reduce anxiety, dread, fear, to have their health care be competent and applied universally without discrimination. Give me your read of the American people. You're in Louisville. They reelected this nightmare senator, Mitch McConnell, And the person who opposed him only had $80 million to spend, a record beyond the record, and she lost decisively to Mitch McConnell. Well, we didn't choose her. Somebody else chose her for us. (laughs) 
<laughs> and they've been riding us off here in Kentucky, and the Democratic Party doesn't allow the people of Kentucky to have anything to say about the candidates that are chosen. So well, You're close to the people. You have to talk with them. You do talk with them. You organize them. What do you think's wrong? Why don't you just take it to the next step? It's so easy. It's fun. Uh, Well, I keep working to do that. I mean, we have a problem that many people don't feel that what they say matters and that they have any power to change anything. And of course, it is extremely difficult to make the changes because it takes so much to overcome the power that the insurance industry has. We live here under the nose of Humana. (laughs) And they're one of the, you know, corrupt forces that makes a ton of money off of all of these scams. So, what is Humana? Well, it's a big health insurance company with a big In marble Humana. building. <laughs> and a Humana and a big marble building downtown. And they control some jobs. So every time we say single payer, they say you'll lose jobs. So we work very hard to make sure that in the transition to a single-payer system that the workers who are working would have a way to continue an income and to be transformed into another job coming out of it because we don't want the working people to be the ones that are hurt by the change. But Humana has to go as a health insurance company because they make money from the denial of care. That is the That's basis. the point. That's the key point in private health insurance. They make money by denying you care. Other companies make money by selling you stuff, but they make more money by denying you care and pocketing the premiums and paying out less for your health care. Let's examine your point here where you say it's so difficult. I don't think it's that difficult. When I was going in and out of congressional offices before the COVID, They would never tell me they're getting floods of demands from the people back home for single payer. First of all, the media doesn't cover that. They don't put people on Meet the Press or 60 Minutes talking about single payer to gin up the feedback to Congress. And second of all, the focus is on Obamacare. So what do you say to these senators and representatives when they say we're not getting you know, flooded with emails and letters and telephone calls. What you say to them is, give us a few weeks. We'll show you. Once we organize these Congress watchdog groups, we'll see that letterhead is going to grow and it's going to expand and it's going to get you to these virtual town meetings. You see, once you get to that step, Kate, it doesn't become that insuperable because there's already about 170 175 members of Congress that want single payer. I mean, you you know, you're not starting from scratch. But the excuse is Obamacare, that's one excuse. And the other excuse is we're not hearing these demands. Well, we have to speak more loudly. Our megaphones aren't very big. We don't own the press and, (laughs) and we don't control the airwaves. But we have to speak as much as we can and as loudly as we can. I think we should have hearings on that recent CBO report. The Congressional Budget Office finally said national medical expenditures would go down under a single payer system. I think we need to work for hearings. We need to work for all of the things that we can and we need to expose the fact that the Affordable Care Act cannot be fixed because inherent in it is this private for-profit insurance ripoff that continues to deny care and keeps us from getting to a system where our money actually goes for care instead of to the insurance company. And Affordable Care Act is colloquially called Obamacare, in case listeners didn't know that distinction. (laughs) Well, when you talk about congressional hearings to people, they think Washington-based, but they don't know that members of Congress can have hearings, public hearings, back home. For example, Congressman John Yarmouth, he's a very powerful congressman. He's now chairman of the House Budget Committee, as you know. He is indeed. (laughs) And he's fairly progressive. So you say, Congressman Yarmouth, why don't you have in the spring a virtual hearing back in Louisville? See how it begins to change the dynamic. 
Well, I'd be glad to do that. I think that that's a great idea. We've asked him to hold hearings in the Budget Committee on the CBO and, you know, the formulations that came out of that. We think that we have to do everything we can to get single payer onto the national agenda. I mean, they keep it off all of the time. They just, you know, they arrested people, you know, in 2009 because they wanted to talk about single payer. And now, you know, it's very difficult to get it back again. People just say, well, Biden's not for it, and so we're going to do something else. Well, but- Biden is a finger in the wind type politician now. you got to give him a lot of wind. And local hearings by local members of Congress back home, they get coverage. The Louisville Courier-Journal will cover it. The radio TV will cover it because they know it's a popular issue in the polls. Did you know that Bernie Sanders, who's chairman of the Senate Budget Committee, just listed five hearings that he's going to go on on five issues, and none of them include single payer? Well, I didn't know that, but uh, that's a concern, you know. He's done a lot to put Medicare for All in the national consciousness, but his bill is not good. You're right. His bill is not as good as the Congresswoman Jayapel's bill, but he did what you said. He made single payer a big issue on his campaigns indefatigably all over the United States. So he's back in the Senate now. He sees Biden threatening to veto a single payer bill last year during the campaign. And he's saying, why waste time? Let's focus on other impressing things that might get through the Senate. See what happens when the people back home are not generating the momentum. Every month it becomes more intense, the clamor, the demands from the people. Someone as good a senator as Bernie Sanders shelves the issue for the time being as chairman of the powerful Senate Budget Committee. What else would you like to tell our listeners, Kay? You've done so much good work on this, and our listeners are known to be serious. We have very good questions every week. What else do you want to tell them? you want to give them any contact numbers or what? Well, I would like to I'd be happy for them to contact me. I'm at nursenpo at AOL.com. And I think that people should become active in pushing for single payer and should work to block any of these intermediate forms that claim to do the same thing because they don't. In other words, the smallest step that we can take to cover our people and to make it affordable is to go to single-payer health care. It's not like there's some transitional step that we can take that would solve the problem. So I ask people to stay with the plan and press for it because What happens is that Congress says they don't want to do it, and so then we start compromising on what will work, and that doesn't work for us at all. That's how we got the Affordable Care Act, which left 30 million people out and made health care more expensive for people, and so that now we have a huge population that's underinsured, that has nominal coverage, but can't afford their care. About 80 million are underinsured or have no insurance coverage at all, health insurance. Right, and that's just a crime. And we, the American people, should stay with making them do what will work. Don't change the plan to adapt to a compromise because there is no compromise that will fix it. You can't do it in one state. We have to do it nationally. And help us to build and to push, and I like your idea. Get hearings in your district. Don't make it easy for any congressperson not to come forward and stand up for a national single-payer health care plan. Bravo. Kay, give the contact numbers again. I'm at nursenpo at aol.com, and the website is unionsforsinglepayer.org. It's unionsforsinglepayer.org. Don't disappoint Kay. She's worked her head off on this issue. Even if you don't want to do anything, send her a thanks. I think we're out of time, unfortunately. We've been talking with Kay Tillo, the union organizer, 
great advocate for Single Payer USA and get in touch with her. Do your thing. Get your member of Congress to have virtual public hearings back in your district. Nobody can stop them from doing that. Nobody can stop you from demanding that. Thank you very much, Kay Tillo. Thanks. Glad to be with you. We've been speaking with Kay Tillo. We will link to her work at ralphnaderradiohour.com. Up next, what exactly is a civic health club? But first, let's check in with our corporate crime reporter, Russell Mokiver. From the National Press Building in Washington, D.C., this is your Corporate Crime Reporter Morning Minute. For Friday, March 5, 2021, I'm Russell Mokhyber. The Washington Post reported last week that Vivek Murthy, nominated to be Surgeon General of the United States and to help the Biden COVID-19 response, received $2.6 million in pandemic consulting fees and speaking engagements since January 2020. Murthy received $400,000 from Carnival Cruise Lines for consulting, over $400,000 in cash, and another $400,000 worth of stock from Airbnb, nearly $300,000 from Estee Lauder, and $600,000 from Netflix. According to Dr. Vinay Prasad, writing in MedPage Today, these payments are a serious conflict of interest and an example of the swamp that Americans want to drain. For the Corporate Crime Reporter, I'm Russell Mokhyber. Thank you, Russell. Welcome back to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. I'm Steve Scrovan, along with David Feldman and Ralph. Our next guest runs a civic health club. David? Evan Weissman is the founding director of Warm Cookies of the Revolution, a civic health club that does the weird and important work of engaging folks in Denver to discuss and debate and organize and act around the community issues that affect their daily lives. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Evan Weissman. Thanks so much for having me, David. I appreciate it to all of you. Welcome indeed, Evan. Voila, an innovation comes out of the Rocky Mountains <laughs> to deal with the basic problem of democracy, the absence of civic motivation. So you say, quote, well, you go to a gym to exercise your physical health, a religious institution to exercise your spiritual health, and a therapist to exercise your mental health. Warm cookies of the revolution is where you go to exercise your civic health. So what is civic health? Yes, civic health. And, you know, Ralph, we we see it as being down the river from a lot of the work you've done for decades. But we see civic health specifically as opposed to or in conjunction with or maybe more oppositional to corporate health or consumer health. So we think of civic life as what is it that we all own collectively and how do we take care of it and who's involved in that process? So we make sure that it's not a spectator sport and we try to keep it, keep it interesting. But that's what civic health is and is how plugged in to feeling ownership over the things that affect your life that we own collectively. And you tell tens of thousands of people in the Denver area about what they own. What do you tell them? Yeah, we tell them, you know, anything from the parks to the schools, to the libraries, to the roads, to the beautiful view that we get when we look up at the mountains to the architectural history of the neighborhoods that uh, to the jail these are all things that we own and and if you walk around and you notice your community and you notice well do people look like me here is the air quality good or bad what are the stores here how did these parks get here when you start asking those questions and saying well who made these decisions they didn't come out of nowhere And when you investigate that, you see, okay, well, these were made generally by people who were in power. And then when someone wanted to see something different happen, they plugged in and they were able to change it. And that's happening today. And so we find that if people make that recognition, the same way if you think of your own lawn or your own phone, if you drop your phone into the snow or there's dog poop on your lawn, you're going to deal with that situation. That, that people take care of the things they own much better. And so if we can expand that concept and expand that idea, it works. Well, you asked the three questions. Do we have power? Do we know how to affect change? Are our needs and hopes being met? And then you say, that sounds boring and hard. How do you make it less boring and less hard with cookies of the revolution? Yeah, that's exactly what we're looking at. Because if you look at who shows up traditionally in civic spaces, and, and again, we're working in a, in a city for the most part, though we're doing some rural work now and we hope to expand it. But by and large, the people who show up are those who either 
know that they can show up and feel empowered and invited and have been educated to that fact. That is by and large, that's people with more privilege in a city like this. It's normally wealthier, it's older, it's whiter folks. So that's one group. And the second group is if there's a group of people who are immediately threatened by something and it's often too late, but there's a big swath of people in the middle who are potential residents, you know, who have civic power. But the trick is for us, we see it as, you know, most of the time that people have is spent on raising family and working. And if you have anything left over, you spend it on what you care about. That might be church. It might be shopping. It might be watching Netflix. It might be sports. It might be comedy, whatever it is. All of those things I just mentioned are advertised to you with the assumption you want to participate. Here is the link. It costs this much. You'll get free popcorn if you come to this movie. But for civic life, it usually feels the opposite. You don't know that there is a zoning meeting. You didn't even know that that was important. It's in a building that you may not have been in and might be uncomfortable. It might be at a time where you'd have to take off work. You might need childcare. It might not be in a language you speak. So by and large, civic issues are starting from a place to keep people out. So we do the opposite. We say, okay, it is our competition is Netflix. It is the NFL. It is church. It is shopping. But instead of pushing them away and shaming people, we say, all right, cool. Let's do that. Let's do the thing you like. And we'll add in a civic element because it's there for everything. And if I can, I'd say one of the reasons we started Warm Cookies was because I like sports and, you know, I come from kind of lefty political world and you're not really supposed to like the NFL. It's the most racist, militaristic, homophobic, you pick your ism. But the, the people that I watch with, by and large, they're a subset of human being called sports dudes. That's not gendered. But sports dudes know everything about sports, where the coaches went, what they do in certain situations, you know, where they went to college, et cetera, et cetera. They know everything. And it takes a lot of time and it's actually complex. And so instead of saying, well, let's go into sports bars and hold up signs and tell people to save the whales, which is essentially what you're doing when you say, hey, you should be civic. We say, okay, let's do something at halftime. Let's talk about, you know, who paid for the stadium and who used to live there and who makes the money off the stadium and why does the Air Force fly over and why do we sing the national anthem, et cetera, et cetera. And that's our approach to everything. That's exactly right, Evan, because we started years ago a group called League of Fans. And people say, Ralph, all the important things, all the injustice, what do you start League of Fans? I said, look, hundreds of millions of people spend time watching sports. That means it's important. That's yeah. it, period. That's what they spend time. It's our duty to try to improve the consumer justice of sports, the safety of the athletes, the lack of attention to sports stadiums being funded by taxpayers instead of the money going to recreational sports facilities in the neighborhoods. So you're you're right on there. But I mean, the issues that you talk about, immigration, racial justice, economics, education, prisons, safety, aging, media literacy, etc. So you're someone in Denver, you'd never heard of warm cookies of the revolution, you suddenly hear about it, and you go to a meeting of your civic health clubs. So that you walk in, you're clueless. What is the experience like? And yeah, where well, where is the meeting usually? They're very, very different depending on who's organizing them. So for instance, there might be some that are more traditional. They'd be a lot of the programs we've done are downtown at this beautiful old building that is owned by the city. And you'd go in and for instance we have a thing called Bring Your Government with Legos and comedians. And the people at the mic are the comedians or residents, but none of the people running for office or who are elected officials are at the mic. They sit and, and you build a Lego city together. So that's a little more traditional, even though it sounds non-traditional. You go in, you do something, you learn what action steps you could take. But we also do things where, where we're fitting in with what the community is already doing. So we've worked with folks in the past couple of years in the lowrider community who cruise. So this is just something where they already are doing this beautiful art form of adapting the most American iconic thing you can think of, which are cars from the 40s through the 70s. And they stamp culture on them and then parade them. And so we connect with them through what they're already doing, but let them know, hey, there's a process going on that's going to define what this part of town is going to look like for the next 10 to 20 years. And you should know about it and you should take part. 
So there's something like that. We went to different parts of, of the city in different neighborhoods for an entire year and learned about the local heroes and the local history and then the current issues that were taking place and how people could get involved. So that was at parks and theaters and places like this. Are these formal clubs? Do people pay dues or they're just fluid ad hoc meeting places? Yeah, the latter. The way that we're approaching this is we're saying if the formal way worked still, then we wouldn't need to do this. But we're saying the language that people know better is going to something cultural, going to a movie, going to a sports game. So we use that format and then people get interested and then they might come back multiple times. But there are no dues. Everything we do, we have suggested donations, but that's it. But that's the crucial difference is that we do not say, come to this meeting. We would never say that. We would say, there's going to be wonderful food and great musicians at this program, this event. And here's what we're dealing with. We don't hide it. We say we're dealing with gentrification or we're, we're dealing with this specific thing, like participatory budgeting. But the reason you're coming is because in your precious time, there's going to be an, an exciting event that's happening. I think you've touched a nerve on lowering the barriers of entry to civic participation with all kinds of cultural and culinary appeals. And that's a good combination. What's your website? Say it slowly twice. The website is www.warmcookiesoftherevolution.org. Again, www.warmcookiesoftherevolution.org. We would love to be picked up by, you know, really anyone, but our goal in a lot of ways is, and I mean, Amy Goodman is a hero of mine. We want to be picked up by Fox News. We want to be picked up by mainstream folks as much. I know it's a harder, a harder yeah. sell in some ways. But we are always trying to bring in people who don't typically show up and who don't typically sort of agree with some of the things that I, you know, I personally might agree with. And that's one of the things that we are proud of is that over the years, you know, 70% of the people that come are women, almost 70% are under the age 45, and almost 70% are from the low and middle income bracket. And that 72% take some kind of civic action as a result. And so that's who, who we really are aiming to engage. Well said. I'm glad you pointed that out. And you might want to contact our corporate crime reporter, Russell Mulkiver, has a website in rural West Virginia. It's called Morgan County, USA. And I think he would really respond to that, especially after this COVID epidemic is over. How are you dealing with it during the COVID epidemic? We actually have gotten contacted by a lot of folks we're trying to connect with communities that are maybe harder to connect with because we've put in a lot of work over the years. So we've been doing a fair amount of video work. Like for the census, we connected with artists from 10 different communities that speak different languages and to dispel myths and to try to get a, a larger census turnout. So we had them record themselves playing music or dancing or whatever it was. And then at the end, they said, you know, they, they dispelled the myths. So we did something like that. We also have made a lot of other video-based things. And currently, we're making board books, like the ones you read to children, those hard cardboard books. We're making those for adults. One is on civic power. One is on, you know, loosely on, on sort of nonviolence and, and how that works. And then the third one is photography and a poem about the power that humans have and that, that residents have. But the point there is that these are not online. They are not digital because people are sick of that. And these can go anywhere. They'd be at a DMV. And that, you know, the hope is you pick this up and be reminded of our civic power. And do you have a staff, and full-time staff and volunteers? Lots of volunteers. A lot of people who work contracted because they are or are trying to be full-time artists. And then I've had a staff at different points, a couple different people who, who have worked. But at the moment, it's me and then a lot, a lot of volunteers and, and contracted work for projects. One person making a difference, Evan Weissman. This is very invigorating, Evan. We've been talking with Evan Weissman, the founder and contemporary driver of the Warm Cookies of the Revolution elaboration in neighborhoods throughout Denver and moving into more rural areas. Can you, in conclusion, just give your website slowly again so people can start doing something like this with their own innovations and variations in their own community? Yeah, again, it's www.warmcookiesoftherevolution.org. And you can find us on Facebook 
and Instagram as well. Thank you very much, Evan. This is really very invigorating. To be continued, we'll try to get other media, national media, to hear you out. Stay tuned. <laughs> Thank you all so much. I, I really appreciate it. It's been an honor. You're great. Thank you, Evan. We've been speaking with Evan Weissman. We will link to Warm Cookies of the Revolution at ralphnaderradiohour.com. Now, before we go, I would like to just read a tweet from Michael Moore that came out last week. And this is what it is. Then you'll understand why I'm reading it in a second. And this is from Michael Moore. He says, police said it was the seatbelt and airbags that saved Tiger Woods life. When I was a kid, I remember the auto companies and Republicans fighting seatbelt laws and saying seatbelts were dangerous and would cost lives. You'll be trapped in the car. Too many government regulations. And that came from Michael Moore. And obviously, Tiger Woods is one in a long list that includes hundreds of thousands, probably millions of people whose lives were saved because of seatbelts and airbags. So I just wanted to kind of close with that. I want to thank our guests again, Kay Tillo and Evan Weissman. For those of you listening on the radio, that's our show. For you podcast listeners, stay tuned for some bonus material we call The Wrap-Up. A transcript of this show will appear on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour website soon after the episode is posted. Subscribe to us on our Ralph Nader Radio Hour YouTube channel. And for Ralph's weekly column, it's free. Go to Nader.org. For more from Russell Mokhyber, go to CorporateCrimereporter.com. And Ralph has provided two separate form letters to send to your representatives demanding they take action on corporate crime and taxing the rich. Just click on the clearly marked boxes in the right-hand corner of the Ralph Nader Radio Hour landing page, and it's all laid out there for you to fill in and personalize any way you want. Go to ralphnaderradiohour.com and take action. To support the American Museum of Tort Law, check out their online shop at store.tortmuseum.org. They have autographed books, flaming pinto coffee mugs, and other unique gifts for all you lawyers, law students, paralegals, and tort fans out there. And for an independent news source that believes people are more important than corporations, go to populist.com to read or subscribe to The Progressive Populist. The producers of the Ralph Nader Radio Hour are Jimmy Lee Wirt and Matthew Marin. Our executive producer is Alan Minsky. Our theme music, Stand Up, Rise Up, was written and performed by Kemp Harris. Our proofreader is Elizabeth Solomon. Our associate producer is Hannah Feldman. Join us next week on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour when we'll speak to Simon Winchester, author of Land, How the Hunger for Ownership Shaped the Modern World. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you, everybody. Send us any replies you get from senators and representatives to your two letters on corporate crime and taxing the super rich and giant corporations. Hi, this is Jimmy Lee Wirt, producer of the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, and welcome to the wrap-up. First, Steve and David ask questions of nurse activist Kay Tillo about Medicare disadvantage. Steve? Yeah, this is great, Kay. And I always say whenever we have, we've had a number of nurses on, and it's always does my heart good because my mom was a nurse, and the nurses are always taking care of us. But I just want to make sure that I'm clear on what's going on here. It seems like Medicare Advantage is offering like a teaser rate at the beginning, like you would have on a loan. And then on the back end of that, once you sign on, you're, everything's going to go up and you're going to be paying more. Am I correct? Well, it's, it's, you don't notice anything until you get sick. Right. And then when you get sick, you can't get to the doctors or the facilities that you need, and there are all kinds of co-pays that show up. And so what is the union, why are they falling for this? Well, I don't know. I mean, I haven't seen any national statements, you know, about it. But I do know that some unions put their retirees into Medicare Advantage plans. That was our Uh, original letter from a a listener who is at SEIU. And there was some opt-out or opt-in. And she had no idea. You know, it's one of those things where you don't know. And so she did not opt out of it. And then when she got sick, she found out she was in this plan. And that's what sparked this whole conversation for us. Yeah, we have work to do to bring the understanding within the union movement about it, because I don't hear too much being said on it. And they're drawn into it as well. At the front of the ads, the teasers offers things like gym benefit. Apropos what Steve just said. And meals. They say meals 
and transportation and home delivery of prescription drugs. They have a whole number of things, and they make it sound like there's this new plan out, and if you just enroll, you'll get extra benefits, and that's the come on, and the extra benefits are minor compared to what you sign away when you join in. As Dr. Fred Hyde put it, it's not what you pay, it's what you get. When you get sick, then the hammer comes down. David? Thank you. I'm a little confused. So the alternative to Medicare Disadvantage is telling your parents or your your friends to do what? Well, I would, you know, I would say stay in traditional Medicare, but I'm aware that that can be very, very expensive. And the Medigap plans are expensive. I think only about 30% of our people have the Medigap insurance, which means that, you know, the shortcomings of our best health care plan, Medicare, are there. So I would say if you can, stay in traditional Medicare and then fight to fix all of it through a national improved Medicare for all. And traditional Medicare, David, pays benefits much more readily than the corporate-dominated Medicare disadvantaged plans. Is there any chance of a nurse's strike, just a general national strike, like this is this is unacceptable and we're going on strike? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, hey, <laughs> I'm for a, a good general strike to win single payer for everybody, but I'm not in position to organize it. So I don't think it's on the on the radar right now. You give me a good idea, David. Maybe there should be one day where all the efforts against Medicare disadvantage are focused, all the demands, all the various groups, make one day of protest, and that would get more media than a bunch of scattered protests. So we should think about that. And now Ralph offers an idea or two to Evan Weissman of Warm Cookies of the Revolution. I assume you get some good local media on this, don't you? Yeah, we do. And do you have foundations helping you with grants? Uh, Some, yeah. Yeah, it's been growing recently. Okay. So let me help you out. Have you ever heard of the Patriotic Millionaires? Vaguely, but I couldn't, you know. Okay. I, I, I so because know. on your description sheet, you say, quote, so we created the tax day carnival because the national day of mourning should be a day of celebration of putting our morals into practice. Well, they've just put out a book, Tax the Rich. Imagine, these are a bunch of mega millionaires. Mm-hmm. They have an office in Washington with 20 staff. Look it up. And they were on our program recently, and they said that if you get 28 or more people, they will do a special Zoom meeting with you. So this seems to fit perfectly with one of your issues. And believe me, they talk clear language. They don't talk gobbledygook tax language. You'll see if you're lucky enough to get Erica Payne, who's the president, she's a real dynamo, and she would love to do special Zooms, live Zooms, if you can get 28 people or more, which seems to be an easy call for your level of organization. Yeah, that that sounds great. We're always looking to find more people who are interested that we can learn from and that we can also teach a little bit. But like the, the tax day carnival, I think is a good, it's a good example. The only people who will show up to something that has to do with taxes are people who, who already know about it or are vested in some way. But because we had actual ice sculptors there and carnival freaks and magicians and balloons and made a carnival. We also then told all of the tax nerdy groups who were very important, we said, you can't come and just bore people. We're going to work with you to come up with a game, a carnival game, and a way for you to get the information across. A precursor, Evan, we're talking to Evan Weissman of the Warm Cookies of the Revolution initiative that he founded. Years and years ago, you know, farmers got together on real economic issues against the railroads and the banks and the populist movement in the late 19th century. But they did it with music, food, dancing, all kinds of cultural appeals to get these farmers to get on their horses or to walk long distance where the Grange's place was located. So there is a tradition here that you're expanding. You say... You've created 150 unique programs, and you host multiple events per month, including hands-on activities at the Denver Art Museum, Final Friday, 
become cultural partners with the city of Denver. How about that? And regular contributors in a host of community programs at the Denver Public Library, the Colorado History Museum. And you've also engaged, educated, and performed for residents on a ridiculous amount of issues with an embarrassing amount of artists and community organization. And we've served a record-setting amount of cookies and milk. Evan, before we get to the quality of the cookies and milk, you know, I get down to the details here. Yeah, yeah. Let me say that one of your issues is public participation in city budgets. And there happens to be a large city, I think it's in Colombia, South America, which has led the world in public participation in budgeting as a very progressive mayor. And you can get that information by going to the Kettering Foundation website. And they have a magazine called Connections. And a few years ago, they had a whole story on this that was really exciting to read, how this mayor multiplied himself in so many ways to get people actually to participate in the formation of the annual city budget. Have you ever heard of the Kettering Foundation? I have, yes. Okay, so that's another tie that's for great. you. Now, and let's talk about cookies. I believe if you're going to have cookies and milk, you should have nutritious cookies that are delicious. And instead of milk from dairy cows, why not try hemp milk as well? Okay. You've, so you've, uh, you what's the nature of the cookies? The nature of the cookies are, and you're not going to believe this, but we have one baker who volunteers and he makes cookies for everything. And it's his way of giving back. His name is Isaiah. And the cookies he have are... Some people come literally just for his cookies. So he bakes vegan, gluten-free, and traditional cookies from classic chocolate chip to some very weird flavors like blueberry, scones, and other things like that. And in terms of the milks, yes, we, we always have cow milk and non-cow milk flavors, almond, soy. But yeah, we try to be as accessible as possible for everything, including language and Let me put care. a plug in for my mother's recipe called 222, okay. two, two. you okay. know, Two cups of this, flour, two cups of raisins, two cups of walnuts, two cups of wheat germ. It's a spectacular cookie. It's the, the recipes in our new book, the Ralph Nader and Family Cookbook, if I can make a plug for that. Yeah. But this is good. It's good to have something that tastes good, but it's good for you as well. Have you ever gotten on public broadcast TV, PBS? Have you gotten on NPR? I mean, this Only seems locally. like something people can pick up all over the country. Yeah, only locally have we been on local PBS and NPR affiliates. How many years you've been at this? Officially, we started in 2012, so we've been doing little stuff before that. But yeah, so it's been about you know nine years where it's been full on. And so yeah, we're we're hoping part of what we're doing is expanding this model, the Civic Health Club model, so that in other communities it wouldn't be warm cookies of the revolution. It would be whatever they want to call it and what however they want to run it. Have any other communities picked it up yet? We've been contacted by probably 60 different places over the years. We're only now formalizing what we're doing. So there's some folks in Cincinnati, some folks in Seattle, and then we are focusing our attention in some rural areas in a different part of Colorado to try to get a toolkit together and some videos and some design help so that we're doing this in the right way. We're not trying to be the Chipotle of civic engagement or anything like that. We These things have to come from, from the communities and be run by the communities, but but we, we do think that we have a lot to offer in terms of some of the, the creativity we've brought into it. Let me suggest that you call Amy Goodman and uh, Democracy Now!, the War and Peace Report. This tells me that there's a lot of peace in what you're doing, and she has a lot about war, and she needs to have more on peace. And contact the NPR's Lulu on Sunday. She would love to cover something like that, I would assume, given the kinds of programs she's had. And that's a huge audience, NPR Sunday morning. So you get all kinds of pickup here. And that's a wrap. Join us next week when Ralph welcomes Simon Winchester, author of Land, How the Hunger for Ownership Shaped the Modern World. Until next time. Stand up, stand up. You've been sitting way.